Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education on Tuesday afternoon, January 10th, 1, 28 p.m. Uh, we have a relatively uh, light schedule this afternoon, so everyone knows uh, we have chairs meetings every Tuesday at 4 p.m. So we will need to always adjourn generally, you know, a couple minutes before 4 p.m. Uh, on Tuesdays. And uh, yeah, so we'll transition and get right to it. We're going to start today. We're going to hear from uh, Secretary French uh, again uh, on goals and priorities. Then we'll hear from Jeff Francis and Chelsea Myers. Nice to see you. Uh, I've already said hello to Jeff. Uh, a little bit about uh, their updates and introductions and priorities. And then uh, we'll have a sort of an introduction to education policy and recap from the last session from Ledge Council. So uh, for those watching and those here, I suspect we'll probably end uh, around 3.30 or quarter to four. With that, Mr. Secretary, if you don't mind joining us at the end of the table, it's great to see you in person. Thanks for joining us last week. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, Dan French, Secretary of Education. And uh, as you know, we've just asked you to come in a little bit and talk about right. goals and priorities for the agency this year. So with that, the floor is yeah. yours. Well, thank you. And uh, I think we have some slides. So if you have them, I see hard copy and there's on the screen behind me. Um, as I mentioned on Friday, it's uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. It's good to see you in person. Um, and Mr. Secretary, I apologize for interrupting. I will just let people know that I believe uh, you should have these saved for you. You asked for everything to be online. Is that still oh, what you'd like? Let me think. I, 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 I okay. Have I have an extra copy Do you want to? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any, could you mind printing up a, a copy of this? Uh, yeah. So she has it. Uh, great. Please, the floor is yours. The, um, this is a follow-up from uh, last week of the chair's prompt. I thought I'd still continue sort of on an introductory sort of line, um, you know, it is uh, education policy, I think it's one of the more complex policy areas. Uh, congratulations on working in it. Uh, um, the application pool was huge this year. It's an, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so these were the four that made the yeah. cut. And it is, uh, try not to use acronyms, which is really hard. I think I could win that contest among uh, my colleagues in the cabinet who could use the most acronyms. I'm pretty convinced education uh -huh. could, mm -hmm. could dominate that pretty quickly. Um, so I, I thought I, what I'd do in, in the slides is just continue to provide an introduction and talk briefly about policy priorities. And um, you know, we say that the agency's policy priorities, the agency doesn't have policy priorities per se. The governor has policy priorities in education. And I'm happy to talk about those, but I would acknowledge that um, the governor talks about those formally first in an inaugural or state of the state address, and then more specifically in a budget address. And that budget address isn't scheduled until later this month. So. Um, the policy priorities I'll talk about today are ones that I think are already being circulated and we've socialized with educational leaders, uh, but there'll be others coming uh, and I'll talk more specifically about them after the government's budget address. So in terms of, um, I thought I'd start off by providing uh, an introduction to the agency of education. Um, state agencies are, are different um, and uh, give you an opportunity to ask me any questions on this information at all. This is sort of foundational information. The, uh, as I mentioned, um, I've been working in Vermont as an educational leader for about 20 years or so. I think one of the key things I point out, uh, Hayden, if you want to go to the next slide, the, um, from a structural point, and I didn't put it here, uh, it wasn't too long ago that the Agency of Education was a Department of Education. And that occurred uh, sometime around 2012 or so. And uh, that's important because the, um, my predecessors, for the most part, were commissioners of education hired by the State Board of Education. So um, that, that didn't lend itself necessarily to a direct responsibility to the governor. Uh, the, the commissioner of education, the department, um, largely was supervised by the State Board of Education. And that's, that, that structure is still in uh, the DNA, if you will, of a lot of talk about the session. Um, in 2012, the law was changed and uh, the Department of Education became an agency of education. Um, the Secretary of Education became an appointee of the governor. Uh, that process uh, still involves the state board. So for instance, when I applied for this position, uh, the law specifies that the State Board of Education uh, conduct the search 
and uh, surface no fewer than three candidates for the governor's consideration. And the law also specifies uh, the background, the qualifications, if you will, of a secretary of education. So uh, the, the construct in law basically requires someone of secretary of education to have experience in education in Vermont. And it does involve the State Board of Education. The State Board advances candidates for the governor. But I'm, uh, as secretary, I'm very much, I report to the governor. I'm a member of the governor's cabinet. Um, so again, you know, the issue about policy priorities, uh, the policy priorities I'll talk about are the governor's policy priorities. And uh, we have a role in uh, creating those for the governor, but um, they are his priorities. If I may interrupt, yeah, it, it was back in 2012 when it was Representative Joey Donovan, I think, in particular, uh, took the charge uh, of making that change. And several of us really did end up being convinced that if you're the governor of the state of Vermont, he or she should be able to run on education issues and be able to right. hire and fire his or her own secretary of education rather than leave it really to this unelected body of appointed people. And over the next few days, we'll get a good sense and hopefully Secretary French would be willing also to talk a little bit uh, about your interactions with the state board. Because if you think about education policy in general in this state, certainly think of you, know, you, you think of all of us, you think of the state board, you think of the school boards, uh, and then things kind of trickle down from there. But it was a very, I'd say, contentious discussion and debate. Should, should the governor be able to uh, you know, appoint his or her own secretary? I ended up being, they say, converts become you know, zealots. And I really believe, and I've had bills in also over the years that have said, enough with the state board even being involved. I really felt as though it, it's never happened, but I really feel as though uh, the governor should be able to say, sort of leave the state board's involvement behind, that it was ended up being a compromise. They would come up with candidates from which the governor would choose. Uh, so. yeah. The only one of you on his cabinet, correct, that has that kind of process. Is um, that accurate? I or? believe so. I'm, okay. I'm not overly familiar. I believe yeah. so. Um, yeah. The um, and certainly, I think uh, you know the issues. A lot of the older structures are again; they're still around. So the issues of the state board and so forth, uh, we've made accommodations for those things. I was thinking of um, you know in twenty around 2012, 2010 to twenty twelve. I was president of the superintendent association, working with Jeff, and I remember. Um, this debate was contentious inside the Superintendents Association as well, you know, because the concern was the over politicization of education, right? Um, and I, I very much view education as a nonpartisan issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's integral today, I think, to broader societal uh, development and economic development, certainly, let alone human development being the morally right thing to do. Yeah. Um, but even when prior, really, governors could say, hey, that's not my that's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. You know, it's the state board. Yeah. Your child isn't being educated. You know, that's, that's right. something to talk to the state board. Yeah, about. and yeah. I think it's, I, I was always an advocate for it. You mentioned being converted. I think I was an advocate and came out of that process even more so of an advocate. Yeah. Um, and I, I always think about that moment um, now as secretary when I'm sitting in an inaugural address. Because one of the things I referred to back in, I think it was 2012, was that the commissioner of education wasn't even in the room for the speech, was in the hallway wow. listening to the governor's speech. Yeah, yeah. And as secretary, um, I'm, you know, we're directly involved in the speech, you know, we're, the governor mentions education, so that, that um, approach has been realized to a certain extent. The governors are more directly in, in, involved in education policy yeah. than previously. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, certainly, um, you know, almost have to put a pause in this narrative for two years as a result of COVID, you know, but um, and that we should talk about COVID at some point as well, because that's had a profound impact on a lot of what we're going to talk about. But prior to the pandemic um, and what you have in front of you in terms of a purpose statement was work that we started in 2018. It's still very much in this sort of trajectory of, well, what is the role of the agency compared to a department? What is the role of the secretary who reports to the governor? And we started some work internally inside the agency. Like, you know, I was new as any new leader. What's, what's our purpose? And sometimes this kind of work is viewed as mission and vision uh, work. Uh, we concluded pretty quickly that we don't have a mission and vision because that comes from the Constitution of Vermont, you know? Um, it's not for us inside the administration in, in, in the Agency of Education to decide what our purpose is. You tell us what our purpose is. The people of Vermont have told us what our purpose is. Education is one of those few things that's mentioned explicitly in the Vermont Constitution. 
And um, so when we look at our purpose statement, it's within that understanding that our job is basically to implement the laws fundamentally. And uh, as, as the chair mentioned, a key feature I think that is distinguishing between other policy areas is we delegate considerable amount of authority for the service of education to local school districts. So part of what you'll grow to understand is what's the role of the state, what's the role of the local school districts, what's the role of the state board. The division of roles and responsibilities um, works well, but it's a delicate balance and it requires everyone to do their part, more or less. So, you know, uh, the agency of education plays a critical role in the success of not only uh, fulfilling its responsibility, but also facilitating that partnership. Um, so primarily our job is to uh, fulfill the charge of the Constitution and the charge of the law um, that talks about a commitment to high quality education for all students. You know, to, to, to drill it down to two simple words, it's quality and equity. Those are our two sort of bylines, and that's, that's what we sent to do. So th then the question is in the purpose statement, how do we do that? We do that through three things. Uh, one is leadership. Um, again, that's, you know, I start talking about the different roles and responsibility and a lot of the facilitation or coordination of those roles. That falls to us often to provide that leadership. So in support of your committee, in support of the superintendents, in support of school boards, um, you know, we, we sort of sit in the middle and provide the glue, if you will, and sometimes that means doing more than just what the law requires. It means acting, uh, you know, on what's right or speaking out on issues. And I'll use an example like literacy, for example, which emerged as a major policy priority for the General Assembly. A lot of that conversation uh, comes from or initiated from the agency saying, look at our data. Our data isn't good. What do we do about it? You know, so we just raise that issue. That's a leadership function. That isn't anything I was required to do, um, but that's, that's a responsibility that you would expect us to be able to perform. So that's an example of leadership. Um, the other two functions are really critical to the success of the system, and that's support and oversight. And they're really a continuum. And I, I would make the case that oversight is actually a function of support. It's a, for, it's a form of support, tough love, if you will, maybe. But um, it's important to provide technical support to people, but also uh, help them be responsible and, and then ultimately hold them so accountable uh, uh, to the state and to taxpayers. So um, we have a variety of, of things we do along that continuum. Um, a lot of, you know, and I'll get into the structure of the agency if I take special ed as an example, right, which is one of the more complex areas of supervision that we have inside the agency. Uh, we provide direct technical support on how to provision special education, but we're also responsible and part of the federal government to do monitoring to actually come in and make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because you have an obligation, it's a civil rights entitlement. Um, so we have a responsibility to the agency both to provide support and oversight in those kinds of situations. Uh, maybe I'll pause there. Do you have any questions? Or? Okay. Uh, Hayden, you want to go to the next slide? So getting into uh, the structure of the agency itself, I just, you know, a general introduction again. Um, and this might help a little bit with uh, when you start receiving testimony from people. Uh, we can provide a much more detailed organizational chart and so forth if you're interested in that kind of issue, but I thought I'd just sort of start off again at an introductory level. Um, the Agency of Education has approximately 160 employees. Uh, we're located on, in National Life. Uh, I'd love to take you on a tour sometime if you want to come up and visit. Uh, coincidentally, uh, just to pause, we moved the agency uh, back the same time we were doing the purpose statement. And pretty much the next thing we did was move the agency from Barrie to Montpelier. And that was part of a, a very complex uh, inter multiple agencies, at least six agencies, I think, were involved in moving spaces around. And that was a result of a fire, I think, that took place on the fifth floor of National Life um, that resulted in, uh, I think, the Agency of Transportation moving to alternate locations um, and then just doing an analysis of how to best utilize space among the different uh, spaces that the state leases. Coincidentally, the Agency of Education fits quite nicely into uh, the National Life footprint where some of the other agencies were spread out among multiple buildings and so forth. So, uh, but it was tricky, as you can imagine, to move multiple agencies at the same time. And, and uh, we were also revising our org chart and so forth, so it was very complex. At any rate, we're 160 employees. 
uh, we're organized into divisions. Uh, divisions have 20 to 30 people in them. <clears throat> so this is, you know, we start thinking about social policy in Vermont to draw the contrast between the Agency of Human Services, for example. One of the partner agencies that we do most of our work with, the Agency of Human Services is like 3,500 people, somewhere in that ballpark. They have departments that are much bigger than our agency. So uh, like Dr. Levine and I, who work so closely in the pandemic, his Department of Health is approximately 500 employees and I have 160. So the reason I point that out is when we talk about, in many of the cases, integrating social and education policy, how our agencies and departments come together matters because we don't have necessarily a deep organizational chart. We're kind of flat relative to some of the other organizations. So it's, it's a little different how we, how we integrate. Um, but we have divisions, and the divisions starting with the first one, and I'll, just say, I'll say the other thing, this is always a work in progress because how we organize the agency is a direct reflection of the laws you create and the policies we have to enact. So um, this changes as a response to the work that we have to do, and the work evolves over time. Some of these things are fairly stable, uh, however, due to federal requirements, and I'll talk a little bit about the federal involvement in education. Student Pathways is an example of a division that changed over time as a result of Vermont policy. Um, this refers essentially back to something called Act 77, Flexible Pathways. The reason why Hayden is sitting here today is on the scene. Um, this used to be a division in the agency that was probably called Curriculum and Instruction, you know, that had things like math specialists, reading specialists. And I can remember a time even when those specialists were in a separate organization, a nonprofit called the Vermont Institute of Science, Math, and Technology. And then uh, Commissioner Kate, when he was commissioner, brought those things back inside the agency. But uh, we enacted a, what we call flexible pathways in Vermont um, 2013. And the agency's organizational structure changed to accommodate that. So this is Jessica Careless, who I think you've seen already. She's got a wide portfolio of things in that division. Um, things like CTE on one end, uh, it could be uh, art education on another, and the pathways that go in between. So pretty much everything you think about instruction, uh, other than adult that CTE are in that, uh, in that pathway structure. But the idea of putting them in that structure, you know, is to anticipate a pathway for students moving from particularly middle level high school into the myriad of, of options that are available for kids to pursue their, their hopes and dreams. Um, data management is a fairly new division. That was one that was created right when we were doing a purpose statement. Uh, previously, all the data um, staff where the agency were embedded in the different teams, and we brought them together and created a single division. Um, largely around the same time, we were implementing the first statewide longitudinal data system in the state's history. And uh, it was problematic to try to, that, that, that project was way behind schedule. It was really hard to deliver on that without having a single person in charge of it and a, a coherent staffing pattern around a division and data to deliver on that project. So um, that division is fairly new, but um, deals a, a better part of what we do at the agency is dealing with data and responding to federal compliance issues and so forth, data and reporting. And we can talk more about some of the data tools. I think Jill, was Jill, in, and she, did she, she show you terrific. some of the dashboarding and stuff like that that we can do? Little, yeah. yeah, yeah, she did. Okay. Great. Um, education quality. Uh, this is where we have teacher licensure or educator licensure and uh, education quality from a school improvement perspective. So those two things are under one division called education quality. So uh, educator license, we regulate teacher licenses. So I would say teacher license, anyone who's a licensed educator. So uh, superintendents have an educator license, principals, curriculum directors, anyone that has a license, uh, we regulate that. We have regulations on licensure. Um, we who also, oversees that department, that uh, section? Patrick Halliday, that was right. leaving okay. us to go to UVM here okay. next week. Um, when I, I just mentioned this one because this is an area we, we get into issues that are often in the media. Um, we have enforcement power over regulations. Okay, The Vermont Agency of Education does not uh, investigate criminal behavior. So when you'll right. hear something like, uh, so this, this licensed educator committed an, a crime that's something the state police would handle or law enforcement. We get interested of the education licensure ramifications. So coincidentally, it's against regulations to commit a law if you're a licensed educator, but our recourse is to pull your license, 
or to discipline you on a licensing. We don't we don't convict you of anything. You know, we right. we just our enforcement capabilities around your licensing steps. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, quick question. So, does that mean that your agency conducts the administrative hearings when there's something that is enforceable or that you, that's regulated and you can enforce? Yeah, up to a point, and then we transition that over to the Office of okay. Professional okay. Regulation. Yeah, so we have initial uh, oversight of that. So it's described in regulation and in a law to a certain extent. So um, if there was, uh, it, and this would be just like a typical event, uh, we might we get information from all different avenues. So we might read something in the paper. Uh, so and so was arrested this weekend on a DUI charge. Yeah. So okay, that we we take a look at that and we investigate that, um, and if we found that to be true, we we would go through a due process. Basically, there's a hearing panel that would be formed to review the accusation, the evidence. If that hearing panel found that there was substance enough there, it's sort of like a grand jury. Um, they would make a recommendation to me to open an investigation, and I have the ability to say yes or no. If I say open an investigation, then the formal investigation begins, which would have findings that comes back to another hearing level. Um, and until we did the switch to OPR, it would go to the state board for the following uh, follow-up, but now it goes to OPR. So there's a rather elaborate process involved. I just draw that distinction again, we don't investigate crime. So we have information sharing agreements with DCF, uh, in particular the Department of Children and Families. If there's some uh, information that comes up through it, DCF will investigate child abuse and neglect. If they find in the course of that investigation that a licensed educator was involved, we have an automatic sharing agreement. So they would share that information with us and then we would do our investigation based on the, the licensing aspects. Vice versa, if we were investigating someone for something and we found out that there was a child neglect or abuse involvement, we would refer that to DCF to do their portion of the investigation. But uh, we don't do criminal investigation. Um, so that's the education quality is involves the educator yes. licensure and school improvement stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Just um, evaluations of teachers. You, you do them annually, or are, do they do they continue to be evaluated after they're tenured? Yeah, uh, we don't do any teacher evaluation. So this is you know one of the. I think the key design elements here is to figure out for you what the state board does, what the agency does, and what local school districts do. Uh, teacher evaluation occurs at the local level. That's a local responsibility, you know, and that's that's by design. That's how it's deployed. Um, the state got involved a few years ago about helping uh, develop a model evaluation process, but it never became a requirement. But uh, that's a local decision for school boards and superintendents to understand. So does, the, does your uh, agency evaluate, go around, and make sure they're doing it? No. Nope. Again, what we do or what we don't do is required by law. So that's never been something we've investigated because the law doesn't require us to do that. Senator, oh, uh, Senator Williams, did you follow? Did you have a follow-up? Another follow-up? No. So, so we do, do we mandate that teachers are evaluated? No. No. So to Senator Williams' question, so a teacher could arrive on the scene, uh, be teaching a few years, and just transition into a, a tenure spot There's, without that evaluation? Yeah, so um, I'm giving you short answers to complex questions. No, I understand. Okay. Yeah. But this is, if you don't mind, this is yeah. an opportunity for us all, yeah. to, myself included, and to And I think, you know, in. my, my uh, approach today would be to surface topics of interest that we could come back and provide more detail. Uh, information to you. So I'd start off with drawing a distinction between uh, teacher, um, or uh, again, I'll use the phrase licensed educator, so it's not just teachers, but um, teacher discipline and uh, termination, uh, which is specified in law. So the process for disciplining, suspending, and firing a licensed educator is laid out in the law very clearly. You know, and it is different for teachers versus administrators, but it is laid out in the law. So when you talk about tenure, we, that's not a phrase we use in Vermont, but it becomes harder to terminate someone after a probationary period than it did when they're first hired. Uh, I would say the law doesn't describe best practice relative to supervising someone to enable that process to happen in a respectful way. 
Um, but the best practice in the field is that people are regulated on, or, or um, are reviewed, uh, are evaluated on an annual basis to formulate those recommendations. It would be hard in my experience as a superintendent to recommend uh, termination of someone if they haven't had a regular cycle of evaluation and course of improvement involved. So the statute might incidentally mention those things, but it's not a requirement emphatically mentioned in the law. So that's, that would be the law you'd look at as a termination of suspension. But teacher evaluation, I, I would, you know, right now before you would walk away from that saying that's an issue because one of the things you have to understand, I think, or grow to understand is what's most appropriately done local versus state. And I will bring to you, when we get into more explicit policy ideas, things where I think we can get more consistency. Uh, this is one that's already fairly consistently done. You know, like I, I, I don't know of a school district that doesn't evaluate their teachers on an annual basis. I can't say it's done necessarily well. I mean, new, I used to run a principal development program at St. Mike's, so that's one of the things principals have to learn how to do well. Um, and there's a lot of science on how to do that well. There's a lot of research and so forth. <clears throat> but it's not, it's not standing out to me as a significant deficiency of the education system that people aren't being evaluated. They are. Um, <clears throat> could it be improved? Absolutely. Could it be more effective? Absolutely. Um, but that's, that's just part and parcel of improving and figuring out how to do it. It's not necessarily, I think, a problem that I would think needs to be solved by mandating it. And there's always a temptation, I think, in education in Vermont initially to say, well, we should mandate something. And I'm like, well, I'm always suspicious of that, <laughs> having worked at the local level. Um, but uh, it's a good question to follow up on. It is. Senator Blinch, your follow-up? I, so there's, there's no standardized, uh, how about hiring? Is there a probationary period? Yeah, let me, uh, in terms of standardized evaluation process, there is no standard for it. There are best practices that actually, I could say, fall in like two camps. There's like two major theories of action around doing that, um, just from the research and the models that are out there, but there's no standard per se. Um, you were asking me about probation or? Um, is there a, pro if somebody's hired, is there a probationary period? Yes. Where if they don't make? They don't meet the standard within a certain period of time. They can be let go. Yeah, you know, we're talking about teachers a little differently than administrators. Uh, but the, the the idea of due process is enabled in the statute that it be, I would say it becomes more difficult uh, to terminate someone after the probationary period. You have to have just cause and reasons. It's it's a it's a higher due process barrier. Um, not to say you can just let someone go during the probationary period, but. Um, it's a lower standard than it is after the experience window has kicked in. Senator Ruchin. I'm sorry. Senator. I, have, I have a reason for asking the question. Sure. Where I, in, in a former life, evaluations were critical. In education? So, or no, in, not in education. Not in education. Yeah, it was, sure. Uh, it was in the military, but. Yeah. And what, what happened a lot of times in different units was if you had a substandard officer or an, even an NCO, they would give them a good evaluation. Some down the road, and all you're doing is passing the right, right. So if quality is that important, I, I wonder how you can do it if there's a standardized evaluation. Yeah, no, it has, and typically, um, like I worked as a superintendent to create a standardized process within our organization. So we, among an organization, it would be unusual to have a different process among the schools even today. I think pre-Act 46 maybe a little bit more. But for the most part, you'll find a single evaluation system being used across a school district. It might be different than the neighboring school district's process, but it will be the same inside of that process. And I, I think all superintendents know the importance of doing the evaluations consistently and, and attend to quite a bit of time of professional development, not only with teachers, but with their staff, the administrative staff principals, to implement that system. It's Senator, viewed as a critical part. Senator Hashim and Senator Bula. Yep, I, I think this kind of uh, tails off of what you were just talking about. So there's, uh, so there's no universal evaluation from the that, state. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but are there universal standards? Yes. That, okay. I think so. I, I think there would fall in two camps. There's, there's uh, you know a couple of theorists that are, are well regarded. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'd be surprised to see a, something else out there in the field. Yeah. We do have a day or half a day that's dedicated next week to, you know, what is it like to be a teacher in Vermont? Sure. How do you get there? All those kinds yep. of things. Because I do think the direction you're heading in is, is really interesting and important. Yeah. Senator Blue. I just wanted to add a couple of things from the perspective of having been a teacher and oh. having been evaluated and also as a school board member, um, 
first, as a school board member, I mean, one of our most important jobs is evaluating superintendents. And one of the ways we, you know, evaluate our superintendent, or one of the things that we look at is, you know, is he evaluating right. his staff? And Absolutely. So that's just an important piece of sort of the, the puzzle. Um, and then a, from a teacher standpoint, um, I've always, I've, I've always, I was always evaluated and we use an online tool that we um, go in and, you know, we write our goals and what our, our priorities are for the year and then we have meetings with our principal or assistant principal throughout the year and um, and then we write sort of a finalized summary at the end of the year so there is like a process in place but I feel confident on both ends of that spectrum that it's happening but it's a good question yeah. please and it's, I understand it's not the military but in fairness to the other teachers if you go a substandard teacher and there's no standardized evaluation process, and one isn't performing, the other one is, how do you keep that good teacher here? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah, yeah and I just, I would just say, you know, when you say standard, I'm talking from my slide. State, there is no state standard, right? but it is very standardized within single school districts. You know, I, I don't know of any district that use different evaluation systems for different now schools. Now high school. Yeah, right. I mean, right. it's right. standardized, right. and it's usually, I would say it's not something that's bargained collectively, but it's uh, definitely something that teachers as a whole take a great deal of interest in. So it's, it's very standardized within the organization. Um, so that's education quality, federal programs. Um, this We administer a lot of federal education programs. When I talk about our budget being 156 million, that isn't 156 million out of, of the general fund. A lot of our money comes from federal dollars so a lot of our positions in the agency those 160 positions many of them are fully funded by federal dollars so for example special education uh, many of our staff that are involved with special education are funded by federal special education dollars um, federal program division inside the agency this is where we have things like uh, homelessness uh, student meal program which is a big policy issue uh, for for the general assembly um, the title grants, uh, which is the major source of federal dollars for school, we couldn't operate the school system without those federal dollars. Title one, title two, you know, so all the staff around that, uh, Medicaid administration, all those federal programs, we just put them into one division, even though they're not related to what they're related to is dealing with the federal government and the U.S. Department of Education. So, Ann Bordenaro, I, I mentioned Patrick Halliday, he's leading the quality. Ann Bordenaro is the director of federal programs. Um, complex group of programs, but it's it's incredibly important to keep, keep the organization and the school system running. Uh, student supports, this is where we have special education. Um, related things to special education like MTSS, multi-tier support systems, all the supports for kids. Um, Pre-K is in the student supports division. Uh, finance, what it means, finance. Uh, finance has two components, one is paying our own bills, so as it we're a complex governmental organization, we have payroll, we have to buy things, purchasing and so forth, but then they have a critical role on the external facing end, and that's uh, helping manage the education fund, which you'll hear a lot about. So um, we have a very unique school funding system. We're the only one like it in the, in the country. Um, we have a central, basically a trust fund, I call it, of approximately $8 billion. Uh, that I always like to make that point that is not our budget that's something we administer uh, we take a small little piece of that for administrative costs but most of our budget has nothing to do with that the 156 million doesn't get supported by the end fund on a very very small amount but we have a critical role in um, helping calculate tax rates administering the projections and so forth we work with JFO joint fiscal office a lot on that this is Brad James is the primary person there now Brad's going to retire at some point, so he's threatening, and we're we're uh, hoping that we'll, you know we're trying to staff around him, so we'll have the capacity to carry on. Uh, but one of the outcomes of the waiting, the waiting people waiting, you might have followed that last year. Um, we're trying to we agree that we should have more eyes on this process because it's a very complex uh, piece to administer. Um, but that's essentially finance, internal, external. So and then, Mr. Secretary, yeah. so the 156 million, that is, just to be clear, that's your operating that's correct. budget. Yeah. Okay. And that has multiple funding sources. There's yeah. about 12 appropriations there. Mm -hmm. uh, seven of those are just federal grants. They're not, you know, and they're stable federal grants. They're not like, oh, we got a grant. This is yeah. like 
how every state operates its education system. We always get federal dollars for special education. We always get federal dollars for Title I. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. The eight billion figure is one that it would just, at some point, maybe, hey, you could do some digging for the committee. What does that compare to other states? I mean, eight billion. We're educating roughly how many kids, K through 12? 80,000. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of money. Um, you know, there's uh, the Ed Fund would be a whole separate sure. topic yeah. for you. We, we do have a conversation. We probably, you know, yeah. a month. <laughs> we can make an Ed Fund right. month. <laughs> right. Um, Nobody will come. But it's, it's, a, it's an ingenious, yeah. uh, ingenious in a lot of ways, um, solution. Uh, but some, I'm trying to think of some of the policy concerns. You know, certainly affordability or cost has been one. Yeah. Um, to what extent that number represents spending in other areas, like mental health? You know, are we right. using education dollars to right. subsidize mental health? Mm -hmm. um, right. What is really in that? Yeah. Area? What's yeah. What's yeah. really in the eight yeah. billion dollars? Yeah. Um, but you know, we should also just accept it for what it is. We um, we spend a lot. Oh, school construction is one I'm, I'm exploring. I don't have a good answer for that yet. When we compare ourselves to other states, we are one of the top spenders in education, K twelve. Yeah. But it's not clear to me to what extent that number also from other states includes their construction funding. So we're trying to understand that as we're school construction is a big policy right now. So for example, when we look at Massachusetts comparison number to eight billion. Does that include their school construction when they do that? They finance that in a separate area. Okay. You know, they finance it outside of K-12. Um, we have several smaller teams, uh, legal teams, five people, uh, communications, legislative affairs. You met Lindsay, yep. uh, Ted. <laughs> I think you've seen Ted. Yep. Um, and then the office of the secretary, which is uh, myself, Deputy Secretary Boucher, who was going to hope to be here today, but she couldn't make it. And uh, Maureen Geddes and Suzanne Sprague, who you'll interact with through help Maureen schedule. Maureen always a terrific help yeah. yep. to all of us. And uh, that. Yeah. I just pause there and just say, um, you know, back to this idea of interfacing with us versus AHS. Unlike AHS, we don't, our divisions aren't departments. So those departments don't have, you know, like our divisions don't have separate administrative staff, really. They have directors who are technical experts. So you might hear testimony on uh, student pathways, you might see Jessica Carolus. You know, yeah. she's a technical expert and a manager in her field. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of broader organizational structure, though, it's really Deputy Secretary Boucher or myself, the two of us that really can speak to policy issues. You know, what's the governor's thinking on education? What message would he like to convey? Um, that's really the two of us. You know, we don't have a separate policy director. We sometimes might give you that answer through Ted or one of the legislative staff, but that's generally coming from myself or Deputy Secretary Boucher. Okay, okay so if you need a definitive answer, how is, you know, we deal with complex things all the time in the General Assembly. There's one of us, you know, we're uh, Ted or I. Um, I think that's all I was going to say here. If you want to go to the next, and then just wrapping up on policy priorities. Again, um, governor's policy priorities in education, these are ones that we've initially started to socialize in advance of the legislative session. We have other ones that will be articulated in the governor's budget address. Uh, school safety is work uh, that we've alerted to uh, folks to. Um, the governor uh, formed a violence prevention task force, uh, D. Barbic, who I think you'll hear from yes. at some point. Yeah. Um, D. Uh, has been organizing that work. A subcomponent of the violence prevention task force is school safety. So from that work, uh, we've, we're bringing forward some recommendations, or I'd like to bring forward some recommendations to strengthen the statutory framework for school safety. The, the rub of that is basically are things that previously were recommendations we'd like to make requirements. And there's, there's three, three areas. One is physical security of buildings. Um, and these three areas more or less describe the trajectory on school safety for the last 20 years or so. We started uh, after um, Columbine, <laughs> focusing on physical security in buildings. Yeah. The second thing is uh, comprehensive hazards planning, safety thing about uh, safety planning, making sure you have a plan. Um, and that's a lot of the work we did for the last 10 years. And then the third one, which is the sort of the newer innovation, is threat assessment. So, um, how to actually get out a little further, I'll say outside the perimeter of your school security, but actually being attentive to the dynamics of threat in your community uh, and, and among your students. And this is, this is really about bringing resources to bear, support kids and families. It's not about um, isolating kids or suspending them. It's about really trying to understand how to help kids. Uh, a lot of the research we're seeing in the last couple of years around school shootings, for example, 
points to the fact that the, the people that are doing this, the kids that are doing this, do it as a last resort. Like they don't see mm -hmm. any other way out. So the idea of threat assessment is to provide them options that don't let them conclude that there's no other way out. There's a lot of science behind that. Um, so those three things are the elements for school safety. I'm happy to come in and talk about those more. Yeah, I think you're tomorrow. coming tomorrow. You're oh, coming yeah. in, but I, just a quick question. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like school safety also would include natural disasters. Yeah, the all hazards planning would okay. include anything. Yeah. You know, if, depending on where you were, if you were a district in the shadow of a dam, yeah, you'd have a chapter in your plan about that dam breaking. You know. Uh, so the all hazards planning template, you can go to, I'll, I'll show you tomorrow, the Vermont School Safety uh, Resource website has templates for how to do that plan. Great. Okay. Um, simplification of home study. Um, you know, we, we have a very complex home study law, so we struggle inside the agency administering our current law. We, we think we get simplified while still maintaining adequate oversight of the program, but it's, it's really complex for us to administer. Uh, we want to continue a thread we started a couple sessions ago on uh, model uh, anti-discrimination, uh, hate curriculum, and equity policy. Uh, as you know, these issues um, are becoming increasingly important, and I would say also increasingly divisive for our communities. And a lot of our communities struggle um, dealing with these issues without a framework from the state. Uh, we saw that last year with mascots in the General Assembly that. Um, we, I think we promoted a, a good resolution of that by promulgating a model policy uh, that gave basically some guardrails to the conversation, but still forced locals to wrestle with these difficult situations, which they should, but they need guardrails and they need some help in terms of um, defining language. So we'd like to continue that conversation. And then uh, something we've been working on the last six months, and it's just basically an observation uh, being in touch with other states around the country that we should be elevating computer science uh, right. to probably its own academic discipline at this point. Um, it's emerging as it used to be sort of an add-on, now it's sort mm -hmm. of emerging as a, a, a body of uh, solid understanding that could be displayed as an academic requirement inside of schools. So we'd like to explore doing more computer science with kids. So we'll have other policy issues. I, you know. Uh, major priority for the governor is on workforce development, you know, yeah. with the demographic challenges. Uh, there's a study coming back um, that JFO is running on uh, funding and CTE. Mm -hmm. So once that study comes back, we'd like to take a look at uh, the CTE funding system. Um, basically, to elim you know, continue to eliminate whatever barriers we could to, to enable more kids to access CTE. Um, CTE, can you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Just yeah, the, sorry. Boy, uh, career technical education. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's a great topic in itself. Yeah. Um, you know, to the point of Hayden's, uh, I keep picking on you. Uh, your uh, flexible pathways. One of the pathways uh, we have to work on is the CT, the career technical education. How kids <laughs> access that program. Uh, the study I was referring to is kind of identified uh, the funding system is creating some disincentives for kids to attend those programs. Um, so we think it could be done more seamlessly. Uh, but CT uh, plays a critical role in our state. I think it does in every state right now, and uh, we want to do more to expand those opportunities for kids. Committee, questions for uh, Secretary French at this point? We'll be hearing again tomorrow in particular on school safety and other things. But please, Senator. Thank you. Very quick. Um, no, please take it school safety does not include bullying, online bullying, that's, that's a different... That's a separate policy, separate. Right, I would say. Yeah. yeah, this is really, uh, I would say, think of physical safety, but it's really dealing with acts of violence, Yeah. Um, explicit acts of violence. And again, I think you'll find, uh, particularly as we start talking about threat assessment, you'll, you'll see this is emerging as a body of work nationally. Um, and I think you know the issues of bullying and harassment are, are, are constantly uh, you know out there and been deliberated on by this general assembly are, are more important than ever. Uh, we can have a separate I think policy conversation on those. We have a, a requirement in law around that and uh, a bullying uh, advisory council that is anxious to get more involved and do yeah. more. Um, and my last question is uh, the last bullet here, um, the computer science education. It sounds as though um, you all want to be sort of pulling that out of STEM, sort of out of the umbrella of STEM and its own, making it its own area. Yeah, I wouldn't say pulling it out so much, but I think uh, there's a couple things there. One is um, 
we, we think it would be time to convene a, an advisory council on that to, to really start bringing our industry partners in there to understand it better. Because I find it's, it, firstly, it's a hard thing to define. What do you mean by computer science? Mm -hmm. You know, because it falls into so many different groups like cybersecurity, web design. You get into a lot of the art aspects of it that I think would be really intriguing for a lot of our rural kids to explore. Um, so we, there's a lot of elements in programming, certainly. Uh, so to have a, an advisory group help us figure that out. Uh, but then to look at things like, yes, requiring uh, computer science, how would we create more computer science teachers? Um, so there's, there's several strategies there we'd like to explore. There's an organization, Code.org, uh, which oh, yeah. is a national organization <clears throat> that um, has been providing us policy support to states. And this is where uh, every state, they put out a, an annual report that just sort of describes each state's efforts in this area. And uh, we were looking at our performance there. So, you know, we've got to start doing some more in this space. And um, we look at some of the strategies they suggest, and some of the ones I outlined are ones we'd be interested in advancing. I would just say please include our consumption of technology as well. And consumption of technology? Consumption, our relationship with technology, oh. AI, all of that good oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. AI has been very exciting lately with yes, chat, GPT. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Hashim, I think you had your hand up, yes. and then Senator Williams. Uh, just going back to the CTE, uh, you mentioned there were some disincentives for kids entering that. I was wondering, uh, just on the simple, just a simplified version of what some of those disincentives are. Well, the specific uh, <coughs> report or the study is looking at the financial, uh, how we finance CTE. Oh. Okay. And um, we, part, of, part of the uh, conversation there as to what extent it should be embedded in local school district budgets or should it be just taken off the top of the ed fund and pay for that way. So basic basic idea is that if it's locally embedded in your budget, ascending high school has a disincentive to let those kids attend the CTs. And it doesn't necessarily play out that way, but it just it creates a little of a headwind. Um, so if, if you were ascending high school and it didn't penalize you either way, if those students went to the CT, you'd be more inclined to support their movement back and forth in a month. And it's, it is hard sometimes due to the um, complexity of our governance structure in the state to have kids move across any boundary. You know, uh, So money doesn't necessarily follow kids and things like that. So we think the CT funding structure um, is low hanging fruit essentially. It's been studied, uh, Bill Talbot, former CFO of the agency, did the analysis um, that's now being brought forward and looked at by a national consulting group, APA Consulting, which is JFO's <coughs> contract. So that report will be coming out probably mid-session, and we should be prepared to digest that and make some changes. It's been basically studied now for three years. Great. Uh, it's, it's complex, though, yeah. so it deserves a study. Senator Williams. Uh, you mentioned our organization, Code.org. Code.org, if you go to their website. Is that C-O? C-O-D-E. Okay. Yep, code. Senator Weeks. Uh, just a couple of general questions. So um, uh, CTE is- CTE, Career Technical right, Education. Is part of the Student Pathways it is. Uh, Division. And, uh, and there's a state CTE director in that division. So okay. don't, our divisions are hierarchical, but there's also positions in those divisions that have their own distinct separate authority. Two that stand out are the state director of CTE, career technical education, and state director of special education. Okay. Those are like named positions from a federal perspective, okay. but they're within a hierarchy. And you, um, you mentioned that um, uh, a percentage of your um, budget, your operating budget, 156 million, comes from the federal government. What, what percentage would you say? Uh, over over fifty percent. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll prepare our budget presentation for the money committees first, but we'd be happy to come in and show you, or at least provide you the slides for that. And you can look at it in more detail. Okay, and then we had a we had a presentation uh, last week. Uh, it was more about kind of COVID impact and such, and, and one of the uh, priorities that came out of that was uh, school mitigation, like HVAC systems and such. And I'm just wondering. Uh, it's not in your uh, uh, policy priorities, right. but construction and renovation and uh, refurbishment and such. Kind of just a sense of where that might fall in the yeah. governor's priorities. That probably will fall. I heard you mention that, Mr. Chair, that you were going to uh, get an update on current policies that are in flight. So the reason it doesn't emerge yes. here, per se, is that it's already in flight, if you will. Yeah. And that's a policy you should get an update on. That's Act 72. Okay. Um, and it, as you mentioned, there's also a lot of work going on uh, through the federal dollars associated with COVID recovery. But we kind of 
we were able to work with the General Assembly to bring those things together. But Act 72 and the work under Act 72 um, is a good is a good construct to view all facilities. That'll get into school construction, um, the survey, and the, the assessment that's underway. Okay. And then uh, last question. So you alluded to the $8 billion fund and, and fund. stuff. Okay. So it, it seemed it seemed a little nebulous. It's a little... Is there any way to like in a subsequent meeting just give us like a like a one pager? It's the, yep. this, this is kind of what it is. It's where it comes from. This is how it's utilized. Yep. You know, we're going to at, fin for what it's okay. uh, at financing. I think it's next week. We've got somebody coming in yeah. to talk about and financing. Yeah, we, we have about a about ten about a ten page document. You probably should have anyway. I mean, I don't think we can get it on one page. Okay. Uh, but we have yeah, about a ten pager that describes the history of it, and how it was created with Act sixty and so forth. I think it's a good good document. Great. We can try to send that out to you. That'd be great. Okay. Any other questions for Secretary French at this point? Terrific overview. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Also, thank you. Uh, please, uh, again, I've said it, but you and the administration as a whole have done a great job managing COVID in our schools. Oh, yeah. So well, it's been a partnership. Really grateful, grateful for that work. Um, yeah, a real model for the country. So thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow on School Safety and More. See detail. you tomorrow. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Committee, we are going to take a, a little break before we start at 2.30, but we do have the uh, business of electing a clerk uh, that we still need to do. And the clerk for what uh, really does uh, roll call sorts of things, they uh, facilitate, uh, basically they'll be handed every bill that comes to the Senate, bring it down here, give it to Hayden. Um, it's not a paid position. It doesn't come <laughs> really? with a 401k and benefits. Very prestigious. <laughs> Very prestigious. Yes. It's good, you know, uh, but it, it, we do need a clerk. And with that, uh, Sen Mar uh, Senator Kulik, was, you had some thoughts about clerk. I would like to nominate, if he is willing to do it, I'd like to nominate Senator Terry Williams. Ooh. Williams, if you're willing. Are you willing? Certainly. Okay. I'd be honored. So we have a nomination on the floor for uh, Senator Williams to serve as our committee clerk. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> <That's a vote. laughs> that, I voted as well. Congratulations. Yeah. And Hayden can tell you a little bit about the job. He might know and we'll have you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for taking it on. Really appreciate it. With that Thank committee, you for Thank you yeah. why don't we come back at 2.30, we'll take a quick bathroom break and stretch our legs and we'll start right off with Mr. Francis, Mr. Francis and team. Thank you.